Paul's first epistle to Timothy. Introduction. We are first introduced to Timothy, as Timotheus, in Acts 16 as Paul and Silas returned to Asia to deliver the decrees they received in Jerusalem from James and the Twelve. He would then travel with Paul into Europe, and begin to establish churches there. He would later see Paul stoned at Lystra, where he was born and raised, but that did not discourage Timothy from going with Paul to the work. He was sent by Paul to edify the saints in Corinth, Philippi, and Ephesus. He was Paul's fellow laborer until the end. Chapter 1. Paul Our Pattern. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Paul. Paul is the first word in all of his epistles, and they are all placed back to back in the Bible. Romans through Philemon. Paul is not the writer of Hebrews according to Hebrews 2 verse 3. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior. The word apostle means a sent one. Paul was commanded to be an apostle by God the Father, and Jesus Christ. He did not have a choice. See Romans 16 verse 26, where God also gives commandment concerning the mystery the apostle was supposed to preach. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 16 to 17 For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yeah, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. The hope is not the blessed hope, the rapture, it is the one who makes the rapture possible, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 2 unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace, from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. My own son in the faith, Paul led Timothy to the Lord through his preaching the gospel of the grace of God to him. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 and Acts 20 verse 24. Timothy's mother and grandmother were probably saved hearing Paul as well. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Grace, mercy, and peace. Paul alters his usual introduction of grace and peace when he adds the word mercy in between. This is because he is talking to Timothy personally, and he would need the mercy of God when the devil throws his many wiles at him as a pastor. Grace and peace are the conditions that mankind is enjoying in this age where God is dispensing grace instead of demanding obedience to the law. God is allowing peace between him and sinful mankind instead of giving us the wrath we deserve. From God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, grace, mercy, and peace all come from God and not from Paul. They are a gift from God in this age. 1 Timothy 1 verses 3 to 4 As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Paul writes this epistle to Timothy after his first imprisonment in Rome, where Timothy was assisting Paul for much of the two years that Paul was under house arrest in his own hired house. Acts 28 verses 16 to 30. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine, Timothy was to charge grace believers not to preach Israel's old kingdom message to the body of Christ. Endless genealogies, this refers back to the law, while godly edifying is found in what was dispensed to Paul in this present dispensation of grace. Godly edifying, the Greek word for edifying her is oikonomia, which is where we get the words economy and dispensation from. 1 Timothy 1 verses 5 to 7 Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. From which some have turned aside unto vain jangling, some had turned from charity, an unfeigned faith that permeates Paul's teachings on the dispensation of grace, and they had turned back to the law. Desiring to be teachers of the law, this problem is rampant amongst churches today who blend the law of Moses with grace by spiritualizing verses meant for Israel under the law. For example, to teach doctrine found in Matthew 1 verse 1 through Acts chapter 8 as doctrine for the body of Christ today is to not understand what they are saying and to whom it is being spoken to. 1 Timothy 1 verse 8 But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. The law is good if we use it lawfully. The law condemns us and allows us to see that we cannot save ourselves so that we may acknowledge our need for salvation. 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 to 10 Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, 
And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, the law is not made for a righteous man, the law is a teacher to point sinners towards the Savior. No one will look for a Savior if they think they have no need of one. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, the law is against those that would teach any unsound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1 verse 11 According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The glorious gospel of the blessed God, that was committed to my trust. It was not committed to Peter and the eleven's trust, because they already preached the gospel of the kingdom. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 verse 24. 1 Timothy 1 verses 12 to 13. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, he equipped Paul for his ministry. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, God forgave Saul, and was willing and able to use him, who was before a blasphemer. Paul would blaspheme Jesus as the Christ as he persecuted to true believers in the kingdom church, and he would cause them to blaspheme him. Acts 26 verse 11 And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The Jews that had crucified Jesus were forgiven also because they didn't know what they were doing. Luke 23 verse 34 Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 1 Timothy 1 verse 14 And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith, and love which is in Christ Jesus. To forgive your chief rival takes grace, and God's grace exceeds whatever amount sinful mankind could ever need. Jesus Christ is the personification of God's grace and love. Ephesians 2 verses 7 to 9, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. This is a faithful saying. These very same words are used by the Apostle Paul three other times, 1 Timothy 4 verse 9, 2 Timothy 2 verse 11 and Titus 3 verse 8. The saying that we are about to examine in this verse, and the next should be accepted by all, but they are not. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The word chief means first, lead, or head. When you go onto a reservation and see the chief, you have seen the head of the tribe. Saul, later called Paul, was the leader of the rebellion of sinners against God at that time, because he was persecuting, and opposing the very thing that God was doing at that time with believers in the nation of Israel. Saul was literally the leader of the rebellion. He was Satan's right-hand man if you will, although he did this ignorantly, and in unbelief as stated above. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16 Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. For this cause, I obtained mercy, because Saul was the chief, leader, of sinners God wanted to use him to show the world that if Saul could be saved anyone could be. That in me first Jesus Christ might chew forth all longsuffering. This means something started with Paul. Jesus Christ is now showing the world through Paul's salvation God's long-suffering for sinners. Paul is the first in this age that God chose to do this with in such a fashion. God could have immediately ushered in the tribulation period, and his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting nation and world, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to be long-suffering, and to show the world how gracious he really was in spite of Israel's fall. God begins to save Gentiles before Israel is risen to its promised position as head of all nations during her prophesied kingdom. God now institutes something new, the body of Christ, where there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile during this unprophesied time period, which was a mystery kept hidden from before the foundation of the world. Romans 16 verse 25 For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him, Paul was the first that God saved by grace through faith in this age, and he serves as a pattern for all who should believe hereafter. 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 Now unto the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 6 verse 16 Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The King Eternal, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16, Immortal, cannot decay or die. Invisible, cannot be seen. The only wise God, Jude 25.
because God has chosen to use the Apostle Paul in this way as a pattern to all who should believe hereafter. God will receive the glory and honor throughout all eternity for showing his great long-suffering and love for all humanity in saving his chief enemy. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18 This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. This charge, Timothy was to educate all who should believe on Christ from then on of the long-suffering of God. He showed that to the world in the example of his saving Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners, and making him the apostle of the Gentiles. Timothy had that charge committed unto him by the apostle Paul, and as he was faithful in his ministry, he in turn would recommit that charge to us to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. According to the prophecies which went before on the Paul laid hands on Timothy before and prophesied that he would help make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. 1 Timothy 1 verse 19 Holding faith, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. There are those who teach from this verse that a person can lose their salvation by neglecting their faith long enough. People who no longer hold to the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith which saved them, can now hold to a works doctrine of justification through the deeds of the law, but it doesn't alter their salvation one bit. Many people have gotten confused by Satan's seducing spirits and doctrines of devils after having been saved, and they started to teach things that are contrary to sound doctrine. That is the equivalent of a ship that is sinking. People who hear their wrong understanding of salvation will not be saved, because they will not be trusting solely in Christ for their salvation. 1 Timothy 1 verse 20 of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Hymenaeus and Alexander, 2 Timothy. Their selfish pride led them to turn a blind eye to the significance of Paul's ministry, as many still do today, because of their blind obedience to the traditions of others, and they have made themselves hirelings and not true servants. Delivered unto Satan, this has to do with administering church discipline on an individual who refuses to repent of his wickedness, and then the whole matter is given over to God for his chastening hand to administer correction as he sees fit. Paul could not deliver someone over to Satan for the destruction of the body, unless they were God's child in the first place. They were God's children, and they went away from the truth, and began to teach contrary to sound doctrine regarding salvation, and God disciplines his children, and that is what Paul was doing in turning these two over to be disciplined. They are both mentioned in the fourth chapter of Paul's second epistle to Timothy. Chapter 2 The Twofold Will of God 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 3 I exhort therefore that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks, be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Supplications, petitions, intercessions, prayers for others. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 Who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Who will have all men to be saved? It is God's will that all be saved, but we have a choice to accept or reject salvation. And to come to the knowledge of the truth, once a person gets saved it is God's will that they all come unto the knowledge of the truth. The truth is the revelation of the mystery that has been kept secret since the world began, but has now been made known by the Apostle Paul to us ward who believe. The knowledge of the truth has to do with God's plan for this age, and our part in it. We have to be able to divide our mystery program, which had been kept secret from the foundation of the world, but now has been given to the us, from Israel's prophecy program, which has been spoken about since the foundation of the world by Israel's prophets. Why do not more believers understand the mystery program? We are not praying for them to be saved, nor are we making all men see what the fellowship of the mystery is. Pray for them to be saved, and then tell them about the mystery revealed to Paul, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. There are divisions precisely because we all, have not come unto the knowledge of the truth for this age. We need to pray for all men to see what the fellowship of the mystery is. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the men Christ Jesus. One mediator, a go between. There is only one way these leaders are ever going to get saved, and that is when they realize that God exists, and that there is only God, and he has one mediator that stands between him and them, and that is the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 6 Who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Who gave himself a ransom for all? All of humanity was being held by the captor is Satan, and there was no ransom that we could afford to pay because the price was perfection. Christ who knew no sin became sin, not a sinner, for us, and tasted death for us, to ransom all. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To be testified in due time, this means that this message was not preached before the cross by the twelve, nor by John the Baptist, nor any of the prophets. It was the unsearchable riches of Christ which were made known unto us by the Apostle Paul, by the risen Christ only after the cross. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. 1 Timothy 2 verse 7 Whereunto I am ordained a preacher, and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not winky face a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I am ordained a preacher, one who proclaims God's word, an apostle, Paul was ordained as apostle of the Gentiles to let all of us Gentiles know how to be saved in this dispensation of grace. A teacher of the Gentiles, Paul taught the body of Christ their role in God's eternal plan for them in heavenly places. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8 I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. Lifting up holy hands, this verse speaks more to the holiness of your hands than it does to the position of your hands in prayer. He would rather your hands be free from sin than at a particular elevation. Now Paul tells us how we are to pray for all men. We are to pray without wrath towards any or all men who are lost. We are to pray, believing that God will save people, and that he will bring men to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 to 10 In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. Women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Paul is saying that it is God's will that women adorn themselves in modesty not worldly excess. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 to 14, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the men, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Genesis 2 and 3. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. It was Eve that Satan directed his question to for a reason. And it was Eve who answered for Adam in the garden when Adam was standing right there with her, and he never said a word. Genesis 3 verses 1 to 6. God has given us an order for the church, the home, and God has set the men to be the spiritual leader of both. Eve's sin was due to her being deceived, but Eve's sin didn't plunge all mankind into sin, Adam's did. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam just flat out rebelled, while Eve was deceived. Adam should have corrected Eve, but he did not. 1 Timothy 2 verse 15 Notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith, and charity, and holiness with sobriety. She shall be saved in childbearing. This verse does not mean that a woman can be saved by having children, because that would mean hundreds of other very clear scriptures which teach contrary to that fact are wrong. No single scripture is of any private interpretation. The woman that recognizes her God-given role as a help meet to her husband, and who adorns herself modestly, and has good works will save her own life, and that of her husband and children from one of despair and destruction. That is, if she raises them up as a good example to them, teaching them, and not her husband. Chapter 3. Officers in the Church. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The office of a bishop, it is a good office to desire to have according to God's word. There is no better job in the world if you rejoice in taking broken lives and putting them back together again. The title bishop is synonymous with that of elder and pastor, they are all considered as overseers of the house of God. Notice it does not say that a person will hear a call from God to be a bishop. We are not a prophet of Israel under the law. God is operating differently under grace today. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Blameless, a person to qualify for the office must be blameless in the eyes of his congregation, and God as well in the following areas. He is to be the husband of one wife. A husband is a man, not a woman. Not one wife at a time either. That, along with other comments made by Paul to Timothy concerning women in the church lets you know that a woman is not to be the spiritual leader over men. Vigilant, one who is not lazy concerning the responsibilities of the office. Sober, rational in their thinking and actions. Of good behavior, they are to be someone who is known as a good person. Given to hospitality, because they will spend much of their time with other people and they should be as concerned for them as they are for their own families. Apt to teach, this has nothing to do with a great voice, 
but a person who can deliver God's truth without compromise. 1 Timothy 3 verse 3 Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Not given to wine, Paul had to force Timothy to take a little wine for his oft infirmities because a minister is not to allow himself to be under the control of these harmful spirits. Wine deadens a man's ability to make good decisions. Given to wine means that he does it often and in excess. No striker, a bishop must be gentle, not someone who believes that might is right. Not covetous, he is not to be greedy, always trying to make extra money in excess. Patient, he must realize that mature believers don't occur overnight. Babies make mistakes. 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 to 5 One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? One that ruleth well his own house, his children are a reflection on how effectively he implements the principles found in the word of God in his own family. With all gravity, Titus 2 verse 7 In all things shewing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine shewing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. 1 Timothy 3 verse 6 Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not a novice, the biggest problem a young bishop with no experience can fall into is pride, and pride comes before a fall. Fall into the condemnation of the devil. 1 Timothy 3 verse 7 Moreover he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach, and the snare of the devil. James 1 verse 2 My brethren, Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. James 5 verse 12 But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your ye be ye, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. 1 Timothy 3 verse 7 Moreover he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach, and the snare of the devil. A good report of them which are without. The bishop must have, and maintain a good reputation if he is to be effective. 1 Timothy 3 verse 8 Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. The deacons, plural, as contrasted with the bishop, singular, above. Grave, the deacons must be serious, grave, about the position they hold, and not use it as a position of power to get their agenda approved in the church. Not double-tongued, they ought to speak in unison with the decisions of the church, not saying one thing to one person and another to someone else to gain favor with them. Not given to much wine, drinking an excessive amount of wine for the purpose of becoming intoxicated. Deacons should not be sought out from those just interested in power and riches. Not greedy of filthy lucre, lucrative schemes to defraud others of their money for your own benefit. 1 Timothy 3 verse 9 Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The mystery of the faith, this is talking about men serving who know the revelation of the mystery, which was given to Paul to give to us in the body of Christ. Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 9, 1 Timothy 3 verse 10, And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Let these also first be proved, they should have been serving the church already in another capacity before considering them to this office. The office of a deacon, there are two officers in the church today, bishop and deacon. Apostles and prophets ceased when the sign gifts for Israel ceased in Acts 28. 1 Timothy 3 verse 11 Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Not slanderers, the deacon's wives may hear of a problem in the church that is being dealt with correctly in private, and then tells a bunch of people, and can slander an innocent person. 1 Timothy 3 verse 12 Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. The husbands of one wife, they have the same qualification as the bishop of not being divorced. 1 Timothy 3 verse 13 For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith, they acquire boldness as soul winners and servants, and can teach those that oppose themselves. 1 Timothy 3 verses 14 to 15 These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The house of God, God wants us to understand that there are rules that God himself has given to us so that we may know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, the church of the living God. If you don't have someone qualified to fill one of these positions, then you don't need them yet. Pure and simple, the pillar and ground of the truth, the church not the truth. The church supports it, the truth, like a pillar supports a building. The word is the truth, and the church has the job to defend it, and to propagate it. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 
seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Without controversy, the Pauline revelations prove the mystery beyond a shadow of a doubt. The mystery of godliness, notice the word godliness has a small g, because it concerns a mystery concerning us in the body of Christ being godly. See the doctrine according to godliness in 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. It is about how we can do that today in the dispensation of grace, which was revealed through Paul by revelation. The mystery of godliness deals with us being Christ-like, as Christ is in us believers today, he manifests himself through us as we put on Christ as the one new man. Ephesians 2 verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That fact that the Christ that is spoken about throughout all of the Old Testament is Emmanuel, God with us, in human form, God became a man, is not a mystery in the scriptures. Psalm 110 verse 1 A Psalm of David The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Isaiah 7 verse 14 Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus is now being preached unto the Gentiles ever since Israel's fall that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures.